You know, these are very interesting and challenging times that we are living in. We came out of a global pandemic and now we're in a housing and affordability crisis with ongoing inflation and an uncertain economy. So how do we navigate these kinds of rough waters? Today's guest has some ideas on this. Joining us from Calgary is Stephen Johnson. He has decades of experience as a private equity manager and is the director of Omnigence Asset Management. Stephen, welcome to Bridge City News. Oh, thank you for having me. So you recently wrote a white paper entitled, Is Canadian Growth Dead? Preparing for Stagflation and the Socioeconomic Barbell. You believe that our economy is headed for a period of dismal growth and grinding stagflation. So let's take a step back first. And for any of our viewers who don't know what stagflation means, can you first of all explain what this means? Sure. I mean, it's important to understand the definition. So I'd just like to make the observation, though, that Canada has been experiencing stagflation for almost a decade. And really what stagflation is at a very high level is where you have inflation that's higher than your growth rate. So in inflation-adjusted um, terms, your economy is actually shrinking. And that's really stagflation. And of course, if you look back in the last decade, that's of course what's been happening in Canada. And then we've set up a bunch of conditions that unfortunately are going to make it very difficult for that not to happen for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Now, the federal government went deeper into debt with a lot of stimulus spending during the pandemic and has continued to do so with subsidies for green energy investments. So should we be expecting some big economic benefits from this down the road? Or is it more likely that this will increase the likelihood of this stagflation, which you just explained? Unfunded government spending is inflationary. And unfortunately, in Canada, the federal government is running very large fiscal deficits. It's, it's spending more than it takes in in revenue. And that behavior is inflationary. And so, you know, regardless of all this, these investments, and they're more like subsidies into, you know, green technology or all the spending that occurred during COVID is all inflationary. And to continue with fiscal deficits will just continue the inflationary pressure in the Canadian economy. It's those fiscal deficits that need to be addressed in order to reduce inflation. And your paper points out that Canada's had a very weak real GDP per capita growth as compared with other OECD nations. Are there any indications that this will turn around in the foreseeable future? No, I mean, I'm, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but a problem that takes decades to accumulate and that is, the, is caused by many different variables isn't solved overnight. It takes it commensurately decades to fix. And unfortunately, that's where Canada is. And the list of all the things that have that we have done badly in Canada in, in respect to the economy are quite long. Um, you know, you think about its fiscal deficits, it's the continuous outflow of capital, it's current account deficits, it's a low investment in productive capital, it's massive overinvestment in housing. We 40% of all the capital formation in Canada is on residential housing. It's the highest in the developed world. So wow. we, we massively overinvest in housing, which is not a productive asset, at historically elevated prices with historically large amounts of debt. That isn't a good thing. And then, you know, there are other, unfortunately, the, the list goes on and on and on. And all those things together are why we've had this increasing stagflation over the last decade and why, for the foreseeable future, that's the set of economic conditions we should expect. It's interesting that you mentioned housing because uh, most people think that, well, housing that's, is a good investment because we all need housing. You're saying it's, it's a bad investment. No, I'm sorry. I'm saying we all do need housing. Um, but we have to remember that at the margin, investing in housing is, is consumption. Because you can have a big house or a small house. You can have a house that's elaborate or that's simple, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, investment in residential real estate tends to be less productive than investment in plant and equipment and infrastructure, which tends to generate cash flow and future economic growth. It's not to say that we don't need those houses because we mm -hmm. do. But unfortunately, Canada, those, that investment is a consumption investment. It's not an investment in productive capital. And while it's been a good investment because it's been going up, um, that's part of the problem is that this overinvestment in housing and the demand for housing is is distorting the Canadian economy. So it's massively over reliant on residential real estate to drive growth. 
That's not a sustainable trend. Thank you for explaining that then. Uh, any thoughts on the federal government's net zero mandates and what impact could this have on our economy over the next decade or two? Well, I mean, this is an area where you don't have to take my word for it. Bank of America did a very large global research report on the expected impact of net zero 2050. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a multi-part issue. So first of all, it's going to strand trillions of dollars of capital because there's trillions of dollars of investments in old, uh, what is perceived as uh, ways to generate of energy that have to be shut down well in advance of their actual natural life. So that's gonna strand capital. So that that is it causes the economy to contract. And then you have, depending on how net zero is funded, and it looks like in the West, it's gonna be funded with continued deficit spending by government, it's gonna be inflationary. And of course, it's gonna drive up the cost of energy. And that is a materially inflationary driver. I mean, the, the net zero mandates in the short term drive up the cost of energy. The data is incontrovertible. It's happened in Europe. It happens everywhere these mandates are followed, which is not to say that they shouldn't be um, implemented, but it's the combination of stranding capital, fiscal deficits to fund the transition, and then driving up the cost of energy. That's a, Those are the classic conditions for stagflation. And so... Bank of America predicted that 20, the 2050 net zero mandates will increase inflation above trend by 2% over that entire forecast period. And where is Canada at with its labor productivity relative to the U.S. and other competitor nations? I mean, sadly, and people, uh, I just want to start with labor productivity is not another way of saying work ethic. It's the amount of capital that's invested into plant and equipment and technology okay. in order to allow the workers to be productive. Mm -hmm. And Canada has been very bad at this. I mean, we've, we've, we have very significant capital outflows. The Canadian capital providers tend to invest outside the country. We've had its chronic underinvestment in productive capital, including the capital that goes to increasing labor productivity. We're, we're one of the worst performers in the G7 in this regard. And without that investment, you don't have an increasing standard of living. Household debt in Canada is also in a precarious position. How does this impact our economic future? I feel, I feel like this is a very long list of very negative things. But when you, you can borrow, and if you borrow to invest in capital, productive capital, that can be good because you've... You've taken these borrowings and you've generated an asset. You create an asset that will return, you know, cash flow in the future. But if you borrow to consume, what you've done is just steal growth from the future. If you borrow to spend on consumption goods, you've just pulled growth from the future into the present. And of course, one day the bill becomes due. And in Canada, we are the poster child for having borrowed to consume. And most of that consumption is in the form of houses. And so what we've done is we've pulled growth from the future into the present. But of course, now the bill is due. And so the growth has now been, has been consumed and it's no longer there. You have to repay the debt. And so Canada's like private debt position is appalling. It's the worst in the developed world. Sorry, second worst. I think Japan is worse. Um, and that has consequences for growth. So let's take a little bit of a break from the gloom and doom. What do you see as potential investments that could be beneficial in the long term? If you're correct about the long term stagflation, I know your paper speaks of farmland. Can you explain how this works? Sure. So, I, like, I these are these are challenging economic conditions, and my first observation would be, I'm we're not a, no one can be 100 percent certain what will happen in the future. But I would make the observation to people that are watching that we've had 30 years of high growth and low inflation. And so all many of the things that they've invested in require those conditions. And if there is stagflation, they'll do extremely poorly. And so it's a it's, it's a non, it's like it won't, it's not, there's not 100% certainty that stagflation will occur, but if it does, it'll be very damaging for returns. And so some of the things you have to now start to say, okay, well, the things that I've invested in the last 30 years maybe I should start to change how I'm investing. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll give you one or two examples. So one of the things that we invest in is farmland. We have a very large, one of the largest portfolios in Canada. And farmland does very well in stagflation because the demand for food is inelastic. That's just a complicated way of saying when there's a recession, people don't change their dietary behavior. 
And farmland hedges inflation really well because it's a non-depleting capital asset. It's a non-depleting production asset. So it's discounting the production of an infinite series of crops. And so just to, what does that mean in practice? Farmland in Western Canada in the 1970s, the last period of stagflation, went up 400%. It beat the stock market. It beat commercial real estate. It beat bonds. It, wow. it was like one, it beat gold, I believe, even. So it was one of the best performing stagflationary assets. So farmland likes stagflation. The other nice thing about Canadian farmland is that we export, the demand for our product is from countries and markets with better macroeconomics, with better demand drivers. Like it's the developing world that buys our, our production. So farmland is, is kind of one of those things that if you were concerned about inflation, it hedges, or sorry, stagflation, it hedges it quite well. And a very small allocation can hedge a lot of that risk, like the 1970s. A small allocation of farmland hedged a lot of the downside in all those other assets. Here's another example of, of where you have to start thinking about the demand drivers in your portfolio. Let's take the automotive industry. Just There's lots of different things. There's manufacturing, there's the distribution of new cars, there's auto maintenance. So in a stagflationary world, where car prices ex escalate rapidly, but where the economy is stagnant, people tend to own their cars for much longer, much, much longer. Like the average ownership goes out years. And so think about two investments you can make in automotives. You could invest in automotive dealers or you can invest in automotive maintenance. Which business does better in stagflation? Maintenance. Because people own their cars much longer and so they have to repair them more frequently. So there's an example of just starting as an investor is starting to think about how your investments might be impacted and just starting to, to maybe just change some allocations to take advantage of the return drivers that stagflation provides. Because it does, it's not universally everything contracts. It's just different things now grow as compared to what might have benefited from high growth, low inflation in the last 30 years. And investing in healthcare services could also show some immunity to stagflation. Can you explain? First of all, I like the pun. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, healthcare has very different drivers because, of course, we have a public healthcare system in Canada and we have aging demographics. And so the interesting thing about healthcare spending is if you forecast out, you can see that, that as a greater percentage of Canadian GDP is going to be dedicated to healthcare. So it actually, regardless of the economy may be contracting in real terms, you're going to see growth in that spending. And so that may be a sector that benefits from stagflation. You've got nominal increases in prices. You've certainly got it benefits from the demographic churns we're seeing in Canada, which is an in, this deterioration in the dependency ratio, meaning lots of you're having an increasing cohort of retired people. And so healthcare is one of those things you can look at and go, hmm. Regardless of where, whether we have these stagflationary conditions, to your point, it may provide a certain amount of immunity to that. And in fact, generate positive real growth. Now, in Canada, most of that sector is, is, is public. There isn't a lot of ways to make private investments, but there's the, the dental market and there's you know, the private diagnostic clinics and there's things like that. So that's an area to look at because it may experience actual positive real growth in a stagflationary period because of Canada's demographics. I'm really enjoying your explanation on things, but we're just about out of time. So finally, any final advice for investors looking to navigate potential ongoing stagflation? Yes, is um, although we can't predict with certainty if this is gonna be another stagflationary decade or even longer, um, there's an expression which is, you may ignore facts, but facts won't ignore you. You have to say that there's a material risk of this happening. And if it happens, what are the consequences for the investments that I've made to date. Because that which worked over the last 20 years, if there's stagflation, is likely not to continue working as far as generating returns. And you can't ignore that fact. Stephen Johnston is the director of Omnigence Asset Management, and you can read the entire white paper on stagflation at omnigenceam.com. Stephen, thanks so much for your time today. Well, thank you for having me. I'm Naveen Day. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, Thanks for watching.